I mean, I don't think it's gonna work, bud. Leave it here, then. It can work as a prop. Okay, that's a that's a that's a that's a four year old longbird right there, tail fan. I'll see that brushed off. Really? Yeah, that sure. That's is. incredible. What's that hat made out of? I don't know. Got it in Des Moines last week at the Western store. Boy, she talked me right into it too. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you, Twister, forty two bucks. I mean, thing is, nice about forty two dollar hat. You're not afraid to break it or wear it. Doesn't look you like you buy a $170 break Stetson, it. bud. You're looking to, I mean, it's over with. You're afraid to take that thing out except for Christmas. Jeez. <laughs> I mean, the thing's stiff as a frisbee. Yeah, it is. It's a good looking hat, though. You Put could, it on warm. You could use it. I can. I got this, I got this right. air traffic controller thing on, you know. These are a little, I mean. <sighs> I feel like we're announcing football game. I feel like we're at NASA Space Station <laughs> waiting for takeoff. <laughs> look at this thing. Thing is sweet. Look at the. I like this design on top. It's like that little cutout and it's woven. That's pretty cool little air vents. Yeah, air vents. She sold you on it, huh? She sold me on you it. You were the I'm victim in that game. I was. Well, let's get started here, dude. Like, yeah. uh, we want to just get right into growing up in Iowa and big buck heaven in the world. Oh, you know? man. Um, you've been here your whole life. I have. It's been. You just, I was, I've been spoiled, and when you grow up here, you don't realize you're spoiled that much until you leave and especially I realized in the last couple of years going we've been going to western Nebraska and I know you boys have been out there too and it's it's not easy and there's not many deer and you get out there and realize oh my gosh you know yeah we're trying to kill mule deer but man growing up in here in Iowa is crazy because I always tell the story in 2001 it was probably like at its prime especially out by my house I live east of Albi here we're all where we're set up here with the hunting public boys and one night, because it's legal to spotlight in Iowa, I showed a buddy 41 legitimate bucks over 140. I mean, 41. Jeez. I mean, like two hours driving around. And that's when, I mean, like, guys, it was incredible. There'd be fields of 40, 50 deer around every corner. You know, it was crazy. You could throw a dart and pretty much hit one. But it's it's been awesome. I've loved it, you know. And over the years, it's just been fun, you know, meeting the people that have came through. I worked at our local high V forever, you know, stocking shelves. And it's amazing how many hunters I met just, you know, that rolled through the doors of Hy-Vee that I still talk to these days from all over the U.S. Mm-hmm. And I think that's, you know, really cool. So let's back up just a little bit. Okay. You are how old now? 29, almost the big 3-0. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, boy. You got some, scary. I know. You got are, some miles on you. Yeah, man. I know. I'm like <laughs> and, a Toyota Tacoma with that 240. <laughs> <laughs> and when did you start hunting deer? So I probably started when I was around 14. Yep, 14, 15. I was U season. Um, going with my dad, you know, and my family, we raised purebred Simmental cattle and no one in my family hunts. My dad never hunted. My mom doesn't hunt. My brother, little brother doesn't hunt and just kind of got started by, you know, we had an alfalfa field next to our house growing up and they're, you know, just seeing big deer and it just intrigued me how cool they really were, you know, like all, all, you know, summer and fall, I'd see them literally right out the window and it was just awesome to watch them. And that just transitioned to me chasing around with a smooth board. 870 20 gauge <laughs> missing a lot of deer I mean, i missed more big deer in the first three years of hunting than i have you know my gosh if i could go back i'd probably have a few more big ones on the wall because i've sure missed my fair share the first couple of years of dad and i'd throw a fit i'd cry it was oh yeah it was it was an ordeal, <laughs> an ordeal. so that would have been the early 2000s then when you started yeah, yep exactly hunting. yep and so i started like in the heyday like the state record mm-hmm. bow buck was killed across from my house it was like 237 and it, yeah. I mean, it was incredible. Larry Zock shot that. And it was, right. you know, and it was beat a year or two later, but I mean, it was unbelievable. We found, we found one of that deer's sheds and it was, mm. it was crazy, crazy. I just, I wrote this down a minute ago because I thought of this. <laughs> when you guys were younger, and I don't know if this is before you actually started hunting or not, but you got to tell the listeners about rattling in bucks oh, in the middle of the is, night. This is crazy. I ate a drink before I ran by. <laughs> <laughs> Ted, this is the craziest thing you've ever heard. This it's pretty is crazy. amazing. So I, like I said, Get your I mic a little bit closer. grew up here, was spoiled, you know, with living in a, just a whitetail paradise. And my dad has 50 acres across from our house and it's just unbelievable. Alfalfa has been ever since I've been a kid and it would have like in the early two thousands, I mean, 40 to 50 deer in a, a night. And I mean, a lot of big deer. This is before I really get into hunting. We would go, and this is before I even owned a bow, but it's legal to spot in Iowa. We would go out with a VHS set and get in a fence row in the middle of the rut like at midnight and rattle and it was absolutely incredible what would come in because they have no clue you know and, and that's uh, we all know you know during the rut 
you know, those slow mornings, you're like, gosh, dang, they're probably up all night chasing does while we were out there rattling in prime time when it's cool. <laughs> and so we'd rattle. Obviously without a weapon. Yes, folks. no no, <laughs> no weapon, weapons no weapon. Involved. Just an old school VHS camera handheld. And so my good buddy Drew Arkoski, um, <laughs> these guys know well. So Drew would sit there with the camera. I would rattle like gangbusters, and then I would pull the spotlight up, and then he'd film whatever came in. And how we knew it was coming, we'd rattle for like 30 seconds, set the antlers down, and just listen. Because here you'd go, the thud, the thud, the thud. And then you'd get air brakes because they've gotten so close that they've winded you, hit the light, and they'd be from, you know, anywhere from 15 to 50 yards. And we'd set up in fence row so we wouldn't get ran over because we, you know, we'd, that, that would have happened if we would have set up in the middle of the field. It was, I've got some old school footage of a giant one sided, probably would have been like a high 50s eight pointer, but he just broke off. I mean, from like me to that wall, guys, like at 10 yards, just coming in air brakes and, and Drew's right on him. The footage is awesome. <laughs> I need to, I still have the footage. I need to get it transferred over because it is awesome stuff. Uh, on a more serious note, then. Because you're probably one of five people that's ever done that in the history of the world. Yeah. <laughs> what do, do you think, like, they come so close because they can't see quite as well? Because it sure seems in the daylight, if you rattle, like, they're only going to come so far until they can see With, that point. Without a doubt. You know, they just will, I mean, look at all, you know, early season. These Our older bucks don't want to come out until the very last light because they feel comfortable in darkness. You know, that's just their element, you know. And so doing it at that time, that's just – that's right. That's in the wheelhouse. Totally they feel comfortable coming totally across an open for them field. To, to hear you know? that, you yeah. know, in the middle of the night and go to that sound. Yep, That's something exactly. that they probably encounter often. And the thing with the fence rows, they sometimes they couldn't get down a wind us because they try to come down wind, but they couldn't because the fence rows. So we'd be would be pretty perfect, and they'd come right in. It was incredible. <laughs> it was. It was pretty awesome. You were saying that back in the heyday, you know, when you were in high school and in the mid two thousands, that you could hunt pretty much anywhere like permission was really easy to get it was you know and, and growing up here helped obviously but if you're just nice to people and say you know maybe give them a gift card for hunting I mean, they, they let you you know and you could hunt everywhere which was cool you know I, to this day you know we talked before the podcast started i want to go out elk you know elk hunting this year out west in colorado i just love new new hunting new tracks I mean, grand, I've got farms that I love to hunt still to this day that i hunted years ago it's fun to hunt new people's farms and we love that you know and that was Looking back, we were spoiled because that was cool. You know, there's not much of that anymore. It's really hard to gain access and keep it. You think that's just because there wasn't near as many people? And I mean, if you look at like the overall numbers of mm -hmm. hunters, there was more hunters then, back then. Yeah, more it's going down. Hunters it's trending down. Then. But now, you've, I mean, almost through big buck mania and, yeah. you know, I guess the media of these places because you can, I mean, you, there's a pile of shows that have been on since the mid two thousands from Southern Iowa, essentially. Yep. You know, I mean, we have less hunters now than we did then, but around here, it doesn't seem like it because there's literally every single tract of land has a, a bow hunter, a bow hunter too, right. not just a guy shotgun hunt. It's a bow hunter now. You know, I think now in these areas that are good and that have a decent deer density in the Midwest, you're going to have a legitimate group of hardcore bow hunters. You know, it just gets kind of how it is, you know? And so I think that's kind of part of it. There's in, in today's world, there's a lot of good bow hunters too, you know? I mean, look how, e I mean, you know, and I'm not saying it's easy to kill a big buck with a bow, but look how easy it is today's world to go get a bow and figure out how to shoot it at 40 yards. Right. Pretty there's quick. way more information. Yeah. Well, the technology has come a long ways, oh. but information too. Information. Like you had to learn through trial and error back exactly. in the day. I mean, I missed more bucks with that bow. I mean, oh yeah. You know, that's just it. My first couple bows. I mean, that's, I mean, you can go on, a kid that's 10 years old nowadays can go on YouTube and learn more and five hours than I learned in probably three hunting seasons. You know what I mean? <laughs> Just watching stuff and, you know, picking up on different things. But there is something to be said about learning from those, you know, right. getting yeah, I mean, winded, the, bumping deer, you know, all that. Yeah, I mean, t technology, is, like you said, has made it easier for people to get involved in the sport and get up that learning curve a little bit faster. But I look back on my time that I spent hunting as a kid, and I kind of – I would hate to have not had that experience. Like, just the total you. raw, you know, oh. just totally green and making all kinds of dumb mistakes. You might, I'm with you. But my first bow kill was with Brett Frieden, and we were wrestling on the ground, and this 135-inch <laughs> 10-point comes trotting up, and I draw back, and I spoke him. And that's how I killed my first bow deer was we're walking out at 11 o'clock, middle of the rut, and we're looking at this big giant rub, and we're wrestling, like thinking, like, hey, man, knock it off. You know, next thing you know, we're wrestling, and all of a sudden, 
here comes this 130 up trail. I just draw back and smoke him, and we're going wild, you know. <laughs> Runs 100 yards and dies, and that was my first bow kill, you know. Did he so, hear you guys wrestling, or he just happened to be coming by? I, I think he thought it was a fight. You know, he thought two <laughs> bucks were fighting, ruffling, and he just came to check it out, and we just caught him before he caught right, us. And Right, Yeah. You guys still manage to find really good places to hunt. Yeah. Like, you all don't lease ground or nope, anything like nope, that. None of that. Um, you just get permission. And constantly, I mean, with you, Frito, and Luke, like – you're always finding some pretty good ground to hunt on. Yeah. And, and then we, what, do, what do you do to get permission? And like an area like this, when we moved here, Greg and I, I mean, we tried getting permission for a while mm-hmm. and it was like really tough. I mean, we would spend weeks on it and couldn't find places to hunt. No, I agree. It is. It has gotten tougher for even us who've grown up here. Y- yes, it benefits that I grew up here, but the number one thing is – you just got to be a good person, and, and if you get the access, take care of people. You know, I think mm-hmm. it's all about how you present it when you go knock on that door. You know, I think you got to bring it up like, you know, hey, we're here to hunt. You know, this is where from where, it's where from. This is what we're all about. Just kind of lay it on the table, and I think people appreciate that. You know, and then once you do acquire yeah. it, taking care of it. You know what I mean? Pick up after yourselves. Thank them. Stop in and talk to them for 20, 30 minutes after you get done. That's huge, you know. Just pulling into a farm, hunting and leaving, and you know when they live right there, not stopping by and saying hello. I mean that that, that goes a long way, especially in the Midwest. I mean people appreciate that stuff, or, or lending a hand even, mm-hmm. you know, if they need something done. You know, they're believe me, there's a lot of old farmers out there that nobody bow hunts, but there's probably reasons for, they don't let them on there because they've done it and, that, and they've had they've instances. had sour grapes at some point. Yeah, by <laughs> somebody that's come through there. And the number one thing you got to be afraid to hear no. I think people you know might hear no once or twice and then. You know, they, they, they give up. You know, that's how we got, you know, some of our good stuff in western Nebraska. I knocked on, like, ten doors and got mm-hmm. ten no like, eight or nine no's. And then one guy told us, yeah, there's not even mule deer here. Like, that's that's good to hear. You know, we're out here to mule deer hunt. There's no deer, you know. But <laughs> number ten, we knocked on and said, yeah, here you go, boys. You can have 400,000 acres to go hunt, you know. we get, It's just persistence. Persistence will, will go a long way. Yeah, that's a really people. good point. And it's, I think it's different by state. And I've talked about this before, but in North Dakota, it was flip-flopped. I think I got seven or eight, seven yeses out of eight attempts. Like only one wow. person said no. And even at that, um, there in a couple cases, there were people that were actually leasing that land to hunt it, but they were going to hunt until later in the season. And they said, well, yeah, go ahead and hunt. I mean, I'm not going to hunt there till gun season and or something cool. like that. That is. So, yeah, I mean, that's – but whitetails are not as big of a deal in, in North Dakota as they are in southern Iowa. Yeah. So it's – yeah, I mean, but that is cool. We know that places like that exist, though. Again, yeah. You know, for guys who have had had issues before, where they've got a bunch of no's. You know, at least there's mm-hmm. places that have those opportunities where they say, "Yeah, we don't care. Go ahead." I'm going to totally switch gears here. Okay, that's fine. The goat. Oh man! Like anybody uh, that's okay. It's anybody dead that, too, guys. I mean, that's oh yeah. Oh yeah, I, yeah. That's what I want to talk yeah, about. Yeah, sad. Anybody that sad hasn't deal. seen it yet, you should go to our YouTube channel. And uh, I don't remember. I'm gonna have to look it up real quick. Yeah, so I, I can get on the story. So th- again, a farm <laughs> we acquired permission on. Just you know, um, in the last few years, like right when we started, right when we started hunting it, we put like cameras all over it, new farm, you know, and pull the cameras, and we got like, you know, what is this? We got a full curl mountain goat on this on this farm and this thing looks like it's you know should be at twelve thousand feet and you know west of denver somewhere but um it was just a giant they bought it at a 4-h deal like 10 years ago and it just lives on the farm with two horses and, and the horses are pretty tame but the goat is not i mean it, he'll cross fences get in the neighbors goes wherever he wants and uh yeah so Warb, <laughs> Zach and I saw him. Warb, we saw him. We saw him going in one night. It was actually a good hunt. I forget what when it was, but it was it was October, mid October, early October, and it was just uh, a wild ordeal. We're coming out, and this goat's you know by the horses, and yeah, thing's got a full curl. It's pretty wild. <laughs> well, anyways, this last year it died. It passed away. So um, unbelievable wild goat that roamed their ground forever. It was pretty cool. Free-ranging <laughs> I mean, goats and when we Island. saw this thing, you were like, "Dude, I've seen this goat like twice well, th- in the last four or five." <laughs> and that's the thing: you don't see him that often. Like you'd see him once in a blue moon, like driving out or maybe checking a camera. You'd kick him out of a draw, but that's how how elusive this thing was. Look at this thing, Greg. Uh, he's yeah, like out. Oh, okay, he's out show the beans. full screen. He's out in this field, like postured up, just as cute. I mean, it's a hundred and fifty pound goat. Is oh, what it's it big. Like. It's big. I mean, that's a Boone and Crockett for all I care. <laughs> To this day, some of the coolest hunting videos that I've ever watched are when, like, 
you this is a few years after your first buck, but this is back in the mid two thousands. Yeah. Like you and Chad Lathrop and Frito and Payson. Oh yeah, we were just wild men. We I mean Yeah, all you guys, what were you, sixteen, seventeen yeah. years old maybe? I mean we were 16, and to now looking back, hunting 170 and seven points. Yeah. Guys, this year, okay, this story's got to be told. So <laughs> in high school, we hunted this buck called bison, and, and for a good reason. He got the name because the farmer had bison on the place. But this deer had, like, no joke. I mean, Warb's seen the shed, Greg's seen the shed. It's, it's like that big. It's the biggest antler, like the heaviest ra- or most. Oh. We'll show pictures for the video version, for the audio version. It's, it's guys, hard it, to explain how big it is. It's hard to explain. Like how we've held some 200 inch deer, like a, all of us have. Yeah. And yep. this is by far the most massive antler that I've ever yep. seen. Yep. And we've got a couple antlers off. One, the one year um, after, I'll get to the story on, on, you know, Chad missing him, but the year after we found a shed, it's a three point side, and it is, it's five pounds as a three point, <laughs> you know? So, so back to bison. We get pictures of him, you know, and we are like, oh, deer's pretty good. You know, it's cool, you know? And so. I've shot one at this point. It's it's late, though, probably late October, right around Halloween. And I've got – Chad's playing football, so I've, I'm done. Brett's killed one. And so we're trying to get Chad a buck. He's playing football. Well, he week later, he gets done with football like on the 10th of November. So we get, oh, get up on this big ridge, middle of the rut, and just – I we're 28 feet up back in the day of no tree harness, no tree harness whatsoever. <laughs> Dumb. That's the first thing we were doing wrong. And, and no joke, 30 feet. And I've got this old school camera that flips down, sits on my arm. Like it just probably weighs 30 pounds and it rests <laughs> on your shoulder. So I'm pressing this thing and we're doing a little interview, you know, it's probably eight 30 and all of a sudden up the ridge, like just a dream comes this big old doe and right behind him is just bison. And he's the biggest bodied animal I've ever seen. And he comes into like 40 yards, and that's back in the day. Chad, for some reason, had Brett's bow because he missed one with it, so he's using Brett's. And I, you know, just the, when you're young, you just try all kinds of tactics. And so he gra- he's he got Frito's bow, and so, you know, he gets like 35 yards somewhere in that range, and I stop him, and I, you know, I've got this big bomber camera just focused right on him, <laughs> shoots right under him, and we just sank. I mean, just melted. And we find that shed to this day. Chad, Chad's killed a 200-inch, 230. Two, yeah. two, two and yeah. to this day, I guarantee if you ask him, he would rather have bison than his 230. I mean, that's how much that, you know, how unique and giant, it's how much It's one of the history. biggest deer I've ever seen in my yeah. whole life. Well, it's, it's like, like a local legend. I mean, people say, oh, my gosh, can I see the bison antler? It was just – and so we hunted him for a few more years and never did – we have three antlers off him, but we never mm. did, never did ever get him killed or know anybody who killed him, which is awesome. Like for an old majestic buck to go out, that's how you want him to go out. No one finds him. No one knows where he went. No mm. one killed him. You know, just gone. That was the coolest thing about the early days of like Midwest Whitetail back then, you know, is like we're – I was watching that, you know, being from Missouri. I was working at the appliance store and was watching you guys hunting on there, like 16, 17-year-old yeah. mm-hmm. kids. Yeah. Basically, and I've grown up watching, you know, TNN Outdoors and all these nice Real fancy. Real bucks on Saturday. Oh, yeah, yeah. Monster yeah. Bucks <laughs> Monster and all, bucks, these, yeah. all these professional yep. hunters going places. And it, it and just kind of created the persona that nobody can do this but them. I mean, they, they were doing it honestly, you know. Yeah. Nothing, nothing against them They're just like way. legends. You know what right, I mean? Right, right. You just kind of put them on a pedestal. But then I look on there and, and I, I see like these guys that are younger than me that are just going out there after school and they're just seeing these huge bucks. Well, like my first kill is I'm me spying like a big 160 at the base of the tree, <laughs> me and Freed and just going crazy, you know? <laughs> yeah. It was raw and real. It was raw That's and for real. Sure. It, wasn't, it wasn't the, the polished kind of no. shows that Aaron was just describing. I it mean, was, we yeah. no, nothing polished about it. I mean, the, the footage on that is pulling up to him and he's got arrows everywhere. I, I mean, I spined him, so I, you know, shot him again, you know, put him out, put him down. But it was, you know, us pulling up, and there's arrows everywhere, and it was just raw and real, and that's that's how it was. Which yeah. Is, you know, pretty cool because today, that's what's interesting about the hunting world, how much it's changed since I've been a kid is how it's gone from, you know, it's now everything's so polished and clean. And to a certain extent, you got to have that because there's a lot of anti hunters that criticize mm-hmm. everything. But mm-hmm. at the same time, it's you know, it's cool to look at those old videos of, you know, and those old style hunts that are just really raw. You know, you appreciate them a little more now. People can relate to them that have done it, you know. And yeah. I also think, like, that amount of enthusiasm, and it really brings a new element to the younger generation, you know, that's trying to get into hunting. They watch that, and they see, like, this group of young people out there having fun. 
and just really having a blast. I mean, oh, it, like yeah. you guys were hunting together constantly, and it was just a day to day thing back then. It was all semi live. It was it was just sweet. Yeah, I mean, yeah. It, that kind of enthusiasm is is contagious, and yeah, people can see youngsters can see how much fun they can have with their buddies. And what I really loved was that when somebody got a deer, everybody was crowded around the the bed of the truck, oh, looking yeah. at it, yeah, celebrating, high fiving. We've had a cool group, and that's what's been fun about it. You know, I get more honestly, and this is the truth. I get more excited about my buddies killing bucks and going to chase them and, and track them than I do my own. You know, like when Drew Yarkowski, our buddy, killed that giant 180 mule deer. I mean, that hunt, I'll never forget that. Yeah. Whole rodeo of him shooting it and then having to track it, and we got a follow-up shot and find him, and that was just incredible. I mean, a giant 180, you know, do-it-yourself, mega mm-hmm. giant mule deer. It was awesome. 